everyone to our first Soil Sessions webinar. We are excited that you can join us. I am Shefali Mehta, the new Executive Director of the Soil Health Partnership. For the past eight months, we have worked to transition SHP from a five-year translational research program to a full-blown sustainable national soil health effort. Today, I would like to discuss where we currently are and the road ahead for us as we move forward. I know that there are many of you who are joining us who have various interactions with the Soil Health Partnership. For those of you who have worked with us in the past, this will give you a chance to understand the numerous updates and changes we've made as we've refreshed SHP. For those of you who are newer, this will give you a high level overview of where we're working and our various activities underway. These are meant to give you a taste of what is out there. And if you're interested to look at what we can do from, um, from a range of angles and for you to be able to delve deeper into some of these topics, be it through future webinars, blogs, or through other forms of communication. So I'd like to start off with focusing on our mission, which we have also refreshed. Since we transitioned from being a five-year program to a full effort, we stepped back to see where are we unique and what is it that we do that drives us? And it starts with our farmers. SHP partners with farmers as they try new soil health management practices with the overall goal of improving soil health. To do this, we collect on-farm data over time that enables farmers to improve economic and environmental sustainability for today and for generations to come. So how we support our mission is really through some unique channels and elements that we've built in over time. The first is that we are a farmer-led soil health initiative based within the National Corn Growers Association. We stretch across multiple states and geographies and offer multiple practices that we're testing in our research trials. Our work is driven by our data and is quite analytical. And we are unique in the fact that we create and integrate data in a way that is not done elsewhere, that allows us to ensure that we're bringing the most out of our research trials and on-site partnerships, as well as making sure that we're truly able to get the most of this diverse data set. We are governed by a strong scientific oversight, and I'll talk a little bit more about these elements as we walk through this session. So I mentioned that we are unique that partly comes from the fact that we have three elements that we really try to bring together to support our overall mission. So these three facets are on-farm engagement, the data and science, and the communications and outreach. Our on-farm engagement is really driven by our partnership with our farmers and working closely between the field team and our farmers. I'll discuss this further in the session to give you a flavor of what that looks like. Our data on science-driven focus means that we have not only created a unique data set, but we have tried to stay as close as possible to where our science and research dictates across the soil science discipline. And it is something that we're continually bringing in to our work as we move forward. And the third facet that's critical is our work around communications and outreach. As we collect information, as we learn, it is very important to share back to our farmers, from farmers to others, and broadly across the food value chain and to many others who are involved and care about soil health. So what do we look like today? Well, we have grown. So for those of you who have been with SHP for a longer period of time, you know that we started off with a handful of sites focused heavily in central Midwest and the Corn Belt. As you can see from this map, we have expanded greatly since those days. We are now in 15 states and one Canadian province. This map outlines our brand new program, which is the associate program. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it allows us to have flexibility and it allows farmers to have flexibility in how they would like to work with an SHP. Our partner sites, which are denoted by the green on this map, are still the core of the work that we do. This year, we will have 120 partner sites, including corn and wheat sites. 
We will also add on an additional 75 associate sites this year, which is driving the brunt of our growth as you look into our 2019 and 2020 expansion. We're really able to leverage the power of this associate program to enter into new geographies, especially in the Southeast. We're very excited about our brand new relationship in Tennessee with the many partners that are there, as well as our work as we move into the Upper Plains and towards the West with our expansion through North and South Dakota. And we'll continue to move both to increase our work in our core states, as well as continuing to expand outward. Our ability to investigate various techniques and practices and to create the data that supports our learnings really comes from the fact that we have various trial types in our network. When SHP began, it focused heavily on three core management practices, cover crops, nutrient management, and tillage. Since our goal is to ensure that we are tailored to the needs of our farmers, we have added on new trial types as our farmers are experimenting with other trials. For example, grazing is one that we know many of you are actively already using or would like to use on your fields. We are also looking at different crop rotations, including cash crops and diversifying. So we're continuing to update to ensure that we're responding to the needs of many of you on the field and what you're sharing with us. So our success and ability to deliver the mission is predicated on our people. We have a great team. We are organized by our field team, which partners with our farmers across multiple states, and the national team that supports the field team, provides organization, administration, research, data management, and a kind of broad oversight. We work very closely together since a lot of our work was quite iterative and goes back and forth. Now, what you'll see from this page is we have several blank spots and it is because we are hiring. We currently have four posted roles and one will go up shortly. So if you're interested in joining our team, we offer a fun, flexible, dynamic work environment in a fairly agile, flexible, nonprofit setting with a fantastic team of people, as you can see from this page. So please uh, check it out and share with others in your network who might be interested in joining us. So our field team that you just saw on the previous page works with our farmers throughout the year. As you can see, it's a year-round process to ensure that we are collecting data, taking learnings back, and really having that dialogue as both farmers are learning about the practices, but we're also learning with them. I'd like to share a video that was created by Abigail Peterson, who is our field manager out of Illinois and our lead agronomist on the team. Please take a moment to hear what it's like to in the what it's like to be in the life of a field manager. As a field manager, it's important for me to meet with farmers, agronomists, scientists, and a multitude of experts and teachers to truly understand what soil health is. And this is just a little glimpse into what we're looking for in the field. As farmers are preparing for their fall cover planting, we make sure to flag fields before harvest where seed is going down with the combine or immediately following. This ensures our strips are planted accurately. During harvest, rides in the combine help to find physical characteristics between strips. Combine rides are a great opportunity to hear from the farmer about their soil health journey and helps field managers gauge how harvest is progressing in their region for the fall. We also flag fields after harvest to help farmers plant their strips as precisely as possible using our MESA to pinpoint GPS coordinates. During the fall and winter, we are monitoring cover crop development, considering important factors including planting date, seeding rate, cover establishment and growth, cover crop diversity, and successful seed mixes that complement the rotation and location. This also leads to understanding what equipment is best suited for the field. Cover crop diversity and establishment can differentiate across every field and farm. Our goal is to understand what works for the farmer to maximize cover crop growth and soil health benefits. This work continues throughout the spring and summer. Farm visits, putting up field signs, coordinating field days, and scouting are a few activities that keep us busy. 
Agronomic notes are important to document throughout the season. Cover crop population and estimated biomass is monitored at the beginning of the season. With the MESA, we can scout and document specific locations in the field. We'll even use drones to help gauge cover crop establishment and bring in another view to evaluate the field's progress. During the cash crop development, we can start making comparisons in the field, continuing to document agronomic notes comparing the treatment and control strips. We can really start to pinpoint the important factors that influence yield, such as nutrient stress for cover crop germination success, will help the farmer make decisions. We also get to see the impact of the treatment versus control when it comes to integrated pest management, looking for diseases that may be suppressed or advanced with cover crop adaption, watching insect populations, and noting beneficial insect activity. For me and the rest of my fellow field managers at Soil Health Partnership, it's very exciting to watch the fields grow throughout the year and to get to work with so many great people dedicated to saving our soils. And by helping farmers understand what practices and tools can best be used to increase their profitability and sustainability is very rewarding and is why we do what we do. So as I mentioned, our success is predicated on our people and our field team is key to our work. And as you can see, there is a lot that is involved with ensuring that we're working closely with our farmer sites. We're really learning from our different research trials and able to turn those learnings into effective decision-making and support for the farmers and again, for the broader community. However, our ability to work so closely with our farmers to develop these unique data set and insights and to add to our collective knowledge in this space is really due to the support and investment by many, many of our partners. And I'd like to highlight a few who have been critical to the establishment and growth of SHP. So as many of you know, SHP was begun by Monsanto, which is now Bayer, and the Nature Conservancy, partnering with the National Corn Growers back in 2014. Over time, they were joined by the Environmental Defense Fund, the Midwest Row Co Collaborative, and the National Wheat Foundation. Our sustaining partners ensure that we can both build and grow and sustain into the future. We are also able to do our work because of the support from our funders. And our funders are quite significant. And as you can see from many of the ones who are on here, have done quite a bit in the space of soil health and conservation across the board. It is thanks to their support that we are able to not only bring you this webinar, but have been able to develop a program that really is about to take off. And finally, our efforts and our work is really augmented by the input of several different groups who work closely with us and ensure that every element and facet of SHP continues to deliver the most value and is in line with the highest standards and scientific integrity. We recently launched a farmer advisory committee the focus here is to ensure that everything that SHP does is suited for our farmers, is tailored for the needs, whether it is communications, analytics, or other activities. You will hear more about this committee once we formalize and launch it over the coming month. Our scientific advisory committee has been an integral part of SHP from the onset. They came together to establish the protocols and goals of this nascent program and have continued to stay involved to ensure as we're learning and growing that we stay abreast of our research, of our science, and that everything that we share continues to maintain that high level of scientific integrity. And finally, we have a steering committee that is comprised of the sustaining partners you saw on the previous page. And they advise us on the overall SHP direction. They ensure that we continue to develop and grow thoughtfully. And they also ensure that we are mindful of the many different partners and the involvement of this broader community in the work that we do. Those three groups provide advice and recommendations. Since we're part of the National Corn Growers Association, embedded within the stewardship action team, we are also under the governance of the National Corn Growers, which includes the National Corn Board, as well as the overall framework. So we have come a long way in five years, and I'd like to talk a little bit about where we are now as we turn a corner. 
So the first five years gave us a chance to break new ground. When this was established, SHP was one of a kind. There really wasn't an at scale demo site network collecting soil data this way. Having to be the first of its kind is both exciting, but also exhausting. And a lot of the early years were devoted to understanding how to get the trials right, what it meant to grow this network, how to ensure that our farmers received information, what that it would even take. And I mentioned that we have three elements that really drive us, the on-farm engagement, the data and science, and the communications and outreach. It took us quite a bit of time to also understand what it means to deliver to those three, and it's something that we are now really able to coalesce and, and really drive forward since we've been able to have some years experimenting with the best way to move this forward. So as we move forward, we are going to build from our learnings, build from these five years of trials and establishment. And what really brings us together is the fact that we have underlying core principles that have really been with us from the onset that have continued to evolve and grow and truly direct what we do as an organization. The fact that we are farmer led is critical and at the forefront of everything we do and how we think. The applied research element is also critical. Being able to run trials on fields that are active in such a way that farmers can not only see the impact on their own fields, but that we're also able to learn what truly happens in an active farm, which is different from potentially a research site or other sites. We want to bring in the uncertainty and all the variability that comes with farming in your day-to-day -day operations. We are data-driven. This means that we will ensure that we meet high levels of standards around scientific integrity as well as statistical integrity and sharing. Uh, several of you have asked me at different points, why are we not sharing information or, or at least sharing more of our data? The reason is that we wanted to ensure that everything we share is statistically significant, has gone through peer review and some internal and external review, and we want to ensure that whatever we do share is verifiable. And it's something that we adhere to quite closely. Myself and our lead scientist, Dr. Maria Bowman, both ensure that this is our focus. And we'll continue to share more through our blog and our webinar around what that means and how that drives our work. We believe in being open and transparent. The beauty of being a nonprofit that's comprised of so many different partners is the fact that we're able to share a lot of information. We believe that everything we learn should be shared with the community because it allows all of you to ideally learn from it, maybe not repeat some of the errors and mistakes we've made over time, to ideally overcome some of the challenges and really focus on the areas where we see that we can make substantial differences and really move the needle when it comes to soil health. And finally, we're partnership centered. Our partners are the core. Uh, as our name suggests, it is really the under, really underlies everything we do. We're quite small at the end of the day. And when it comes to soil health and working with farmers across the US, that is a significant and sizable effort. So we believe that our ability to partner with many of you is what will allow us to truly drive impact, but also meet the needs of many that are out there. So what does that mean as we go forward? Well, we learn a lot and it's, it continues to amaze me how much we have learned, not of course about soil, soil sampling, labs, indicators, even the fact that labs have been changing so much, how we look at soils is changing. It's, we're in an evolving space, so it's exciting, it's dynamic, but it also means that we're continually catching up and changing and updating as new information comes in. What's interesting is we also learned a lot about how to manage partnerships, integrate our data, and build really a startup from end to end. So how do you build the back end operations? How do you get things moving? What does it mean for us to work virtually as a team? The team you saw, we are across eight different states in the US and growing. So we have to be light, agile, and yet able to integrate and connect. So we have a tremendous number of learnings to share with all of you, and that's really what our goal is as we move forward. We know that there is much more that we want to do. 
when we had our open call for proposals that just closed on March 15th, we had 50 proposals come in. That is fantastic. It is wonderful to see this kind of energy. Realistically, however, our capacity to support 50 partnerships is probably not there. So we're learning how we can both support those coming in and how we can also enable many of you by connecting you to each other, to other efforts, so that we can all move forward in this space. I fundamentally believe that the rising tide lifts all boats and I see that SHP really, through its core and its principles, can help this and is positioned to do this and it's something we're going to continue to bring forward and to bring to many of our partners and the broader community. And finally, crawl, walk, run. We all know this. It's especially important in an area that we sit in where there's so much energy and there's so much hope for what we can do in soil health. And it's very important to remember that we always have to put one foot in front of the other. So where we've shifted as a team is moving from an organic process to a much more intentional, stable, sustaining framework to ensure that we can run in a healthy and stable way as we go forward. We are committed to our mission and our focus remains that we ensure we deliver the highest value we can to our farmers. That is something that will not change. And if anything, I hope that the last eight months as we have reshaped and updated the program has allowed us as a team and the broader community to recommit to the fact that SHP is focused around what we can deliver to our farmers and working hand in hand as we walk down this trail together. So now let's look at the road ahead. We continue to grow. And as I mentioned, I see the space continues to evolve and grow. And there's a tremendous energy that's out there because many of us see that soil health is at the core of so many other elements, be it improved water quality, air quality. There's so much and it all really does start with soil. So we're trying to ensure that we both have breath, but are very focused and delivering what we have committed to. So we have three areas that we are focusing on from a programmatic perspective. That would be the wheat program, and I'll discuss what that has meant to work with the National Wheat Foundation and where that will take us. We are in the second year of our associate program, and we're completing the third year of our carbon insetting framework, which was thanks to a generous grant from NRCS. And we'll talk a bit about this since many of you probably have not heard about this effort. From a functional perspective, we are in a startup mode. And so with as any startup, you continue to learn where your strengths are, where you might have some operational challenges, and where you have to continue to strengthen and improve and reinforce. There are three areas that we have identified with the help of many of you that we need to strengthen as we go into 2019 and really into 2020. The first is communication and outreach. So case in point, we're here at the first webinar for Soil Health Partnership. You're going to see a lot more in terms of our communication channels and ways for us to connect with you and share knowledge. We need to enhance our data management integration and privacy. So, we are in a unique position as a nonprofit uh, in the fact that we create our own data as well as manage and integrate many sources of data that are coming from our farmers' fields as well as coming from other sources. So we continue to stay at the lead in this position and really pushing the edge in terms of what we can do when it comes to ag data management, integration, and creating efficiency so that our farmers are able to get their information sooner. We're also really focused on developing our research plan. Having Maria on board has really allowed us to emphasize our scientific focus, and we are ensuring that we have a cohesive and coherent comprehensive research plan moving forward, alongside making sure we're delivering the data insights that are necessary for our farmers. So on the research side, there are three core areas where we're focusing. We'll continue to expand our agronomic research from our years of work in the fields. We are examining soil health indicators, and this is an area which is quite interesting. So for those of you who are familiar, the Soil Health Institute was created to help us ensure and really fill a lot of the voids we have in terms of research about which indicators work, which are most effective, 
they're in the process of launching that their uh, test right now and we're hoping to work closely with them as we also have learnings from our own data set and again as i mentioned we're in an evolving field what was known two years ago about, about soil health has changed even the indicators we started with have continued to evolve and our knowledge about these indicators have evolved so it's an area that we are quite committed to and we're excited to be able to contribute to that knowledge and finally the economics of soil health and the ag finance around it is core. For anything to be sustainable, for any practice to be adopted, it has to be sustainable in a way that will be meaningful for our farms. And at the end of the day, economic viability is key because we want to ensure that the farm is healthy and lasts and lasts now and into the future. So ag finance and economics are one of the core areas that you're going to hear a lot more about it's a relatively new area for us, but we're lucky we have some strong data and we're continuing to pull that together. And we will be producing more around what this means and how soil health actually impacts the economics of the farm. So let's delve into some of those programmatic areas a bit more so you can hear what is happening in this space. So starting off with wheat, we're very excited to partner with the National Wheat Foundation. National Wheat Foundation worked closely with General Mills through 2017 to set up a partnership which would allow wheat growers to become part of the SHP network. In 2018, we launched this partnership and we're really accelerating it now as we go into 2019. The National Wheat Foundation is dedicated to investing in programs to help growers really to understand the link between the crop rotations, the on-farm management choices they make, and the yield and quality of the wheat crop. At the end of this year, we'll have six partner sites enrolled throughout the Midwest, and we're really excited as we continue to learn as a team about wheat and the various different agronomics and needs that come with wheat growers. It's doing quite a lot to augment not only our data set, but our overall knowledge and ability to support. So look out for more information around this. We're really excited, and we've already gotten a chance to see the great work that many of our wheat growers are doing around the country. The associate site is a program that is really focused on ensuring that we can broaden our network and reach more farmers. So relative to our partner sites, it is a slightly lighter version of the program. It will use split fields instead of research trials and instead of replicated research trials and it will have access to our network and many benefits to farmers. And so it's worth keeping in mind that the reason we really wanted to build out this associate program is we know that there are more farmers we would like to work with, there are more farmers who would like to be engaged in soil health, and we knew that the partner model was not the right fit for everyone. The beauty of the associate program is that as a farmer, you're able to compare your practices to others in the field to see what the impact is, you're able to utilize and learn from our overall growing data platform and platform of knowledge, and in, be included in events and connect with other farmers to share your learnings and really understand how you can improve and work with some of the practices you're implementing on your land. So we're very excited as we enroll our 75 associate sites this year and are looking forward to what we learn and how we can continue to scale this program to reach more farmers and more more geographies and practices around the country. And finally, the carbon insetting framework is probably the newest of the programmatic efforts for many of you. And the goal is really to understand the carbon sequestration benefits of various agricultural management practices. We received a grant from the United States Department of Ag, so the USDA and the NRCS in 2016. This conservation innovation grant allowed a broad group of us, as you can see on this page, that includes the Climate Smart Group, the Applied Geosolutions Group, Crop Grower and Ag Solver. And thanks to the financial support and matching of Bayer, we were able to launch and undertake this three-year process to really understand how various efforts really drive carbon sequestration at the scale level across the land. As we complete this work this year, 
we will have a comprehensive program that will allow us to look at how the best practices placed on the right acres can have an impact on greenhouse gas emissions as well as other impact. It will also allow us to verify the success and impact of those practices and ideally create a replicable framework that can be used by many, including corporate carbon insetting needs from the supply chain folks, as well as really for many farmers to understand how their practices impact greenhouse gases and carbon and how we all continue to evolve and learn in this space about the interesting connection between, of course, agriculture and carbon. So please stay tuned for more as we will be launching this fully in June, as well as sharing our publicly available Tableau site, which will allow many of you to try out the model, test out what happens at the county level, and for those of you who are interested to also test out your data within our model. So please connect with us if you're interested in learning more. So now I'd like to go into our functional focus a bit. As I mentioned, our functional focus is really around highlighting the areas where we believe we have an opportunity to increase our impact, support our mission better, and our largely operational elements that come from how we're set up as an organization. The first piece is around communications. Many of you have shared that you wish we shared more. So I have heard you, we have all heard you, and we're doing our best and hopefully 2019 and over the next six to eight months, you'll see how we're sharing this knowledge and information with you. So first off, we're introducing several new communications platforms. Our blog just launched last week and it's called Digging In. So please do check that out. We're going to have writing from many of the staff. We're going to have guest writers. We're going to feature many stories from our farmers, scientists, and others. So it's a great source of information about what's happening at SHP, but also really a great way for us to share a lot of our, our data, insights, and other knowledge with you. Our quarterly newsletter, Beneath the Topsoil, continues to come out. And for those who are interested, you can subscribe to that. And we have a new podca podcast that we'll be launching in June, uh, July called The People of Soil Health. And I'm very excited about this. Uh, I tell many people I'm lucky that I got to work in this space. I'm very excited that I had the chance to take this role. And part of it really comes back to the people. I continue to be impressed and inspired by the many, many people who are dedicated to soil health. And we wanted a chance to feature those stories and to really talk about how these various contributions are coming together. So this podcast will allow us to really connect on a personal level with the many faces that are working day in and day out on soil health. And finally, we have this webinar that you're currently part of called Soil Sessions. I'm very excited about what's coming forward. Uh, so as you can see, we have a lot of different topics that are coming out. So the associate program will be our next soil session. There, Lisa Kubik, who is our fuel manager out of Iowa, will be discussing more about the associate program, what it brings to you, benefits, and how you can get involved. In May, we're going to have a chance to jump into cover crops with Jim Eisermond, our field manager from Illinois, who is also a cover crop specialist. And this gives us a chance to share some of what we've learned working with cover crops for the last several years. And also a lot of the pitfalls and trials and tribulations that come with cover crops because as we all know, it's not a silver bullet and it definitely takes a lot of work and we want to do our best to share that so we know many of you are trying out practices and, and coming up against some interesting challenges. In June, we're going to spend more time on this carbon insetting framework and really delve into what it is, why it matters to farmers and how you can get involved. In July, we're going to turn and focus heavily on the data, and that will be led by our lead scientist, Maria, as she walks us through what is in our data, how we're approaching managing it, and our insights. And if there are topics that you'd like to hear more about, please let us know. We're trying to ensure that we're, we're filling your needs and answering your questions, and these are just some of the topics several of you have raised, and we'll continue to keep building out our plan as we go forward. So one of our key communications vehicles has been our Soil Health Summit. So first off, thank you for those of you who joined. Our 2019 Soil Health Summit was one of our most successful ones yet. It was the largest, most diverse summit with over 360 registrants. However, 
I mentioned something for those of you who came to the summit, which is this is going to be paused as we step back and reevaluate the best way for us to share our information with our farmers and also to create the right opportunity for networking and connection. We know that there are numerous summits and meetings that take place these days. A lot has changed in this space since 2014. And so we want to make sure that we're continuing to add value and not just creating more work and more activities. I personally learned something very interesting from the summit, which is how do you communicate with a very diverse audience with different needs? So the information that our farmers needed was probably very different from the information our scientists needed versus who our private companies and NGOs needed. And so we're also reevaluating how do we communicate the right level of information to the right audience? Because sometimes when we try to be everything to everyone, it often flops. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that in different facets of your life. So we're trying to tailor our program and our connections a lot more. And you'll see that as we move forward into 2020 and our next incarnation of what the summit looks like. So for those of you who have been involved with our partner sites, you know that we collect data across five major categories, agronomic, management, geospatial, soil health, and soil nutrients. And so as we delve into our data more, you're going to hear about how we collect those, what is entailed, and how we bring them together in our data set. That's actually the first step, which is just bringing all of this together. The second is then analyzing it. So we're dealing with both ends in 2019 to make sure that the integration is strong and effective to allow us to do not only better analytics, but to undertake them in a more timely fashion. We are building this airplane while flying it, so a lot of this is new. Many of the items that we need do not exist openly uh, in the marketplace, so we have had to work creatively, partner with various different organizations as we develop a way to actually deal with and integrate this data moving forward. And I mentioned a little bit about the data evolution and what it means for us to share scientifically sound and statistically significant data. Part of it comes from our history. So the first few years, we're really trying to get our legs under us, understand what was happening. There was quite a bit of piloting that was happening in terms of what's the right protocol, when should we be sampling, how should we be sampling. It's really in the last few years that we're starting to hit our stride. And as you can see, the number of SHP farmers has gone up drastically. We are now going to be at 220. So from a statistical perspective, we haven't really been able to analyze trends and do benchmarking of individual farmers until this year because we didn't have enough samples and enough sites to do so with the scientific integrity we need. So part of the delay that some of you faced was there was just not enough data to share back. And in other cases, the data was not cleaned or properly set up to be able to analyze it. So again, thankfully, Maria, the full field team, and all of us have been working tirelessly to ensure that the data set is cleaned up, is complete, and can be fully analyzed. And that's really a focus of our efforts for 2019. I've talked quite a bit about the research and science piece, so let me take a step into where we're focusing, what that's going to look like, again, through 2019 to 2020. So on the agronomic side, we really want to understand how different nutrient practices impact soil health, impact economics, impact choices, we continue to delve further into cover crops and tillage impacts. We also are looking at water quality. It is a significant area for many of our farmers. We know that depending on where you're located, water quality is at the top of the mind for many and soil health and soil is a critical lever in managing water quality. So we're actually building out our research in this space. I talked a bit about soil health and how we have learned a tremendous amount about the indicators, about the measures. We have learned a lot by trial and error of what works, which labs can we work with for different tests. Uh, how do you integrate different outputs from different labs? So lots of nuanced information that really is driving our ability to deliver and to make sure that what we're analyzing and sharing back actually makes sense. So we'll continue to contribute to the soil health knowledge and ideally working with partners as they're trying to figure out ways to navigate what we know and how to figure out what we don't know as a community and 
fill in those gaps. And finally, economics and ag finances. You know, I mentioned that for this to be sustainable, it has to be economically viable. And it's really core. At the end of the day, as a society, we're asking our farmers to invest their time and often their private investment into land stewardship and managing the soil. And the reality is a lot of the benefits are actually public good benefits. So it's very important for us to first off understand how these different practices impact the bottom line for a farmer, but it builds to understanding how we can ensure that there is equity and consistency across our full value chain. And what that means is if we have farmers who are undertaking these actions, taking these risks to improve the soils and improve water, we want to make sure that they are properly compensated and supported by all of those across the food and ag value chain, whether it's supply chain companies, whether it's governments, whether it's us, it's citizens, because we are the beneficiaries of cleaner water, cleaner air, and cleaner soil. So you're going to see a lot more in this space. Also, it helps that both Maria and I are economists, so we're very focused here, and we want to make sure that it's very clear that uh, how that various practices that are being undertaken have this broader lens and, and broader view in mind. So I know that we are coming to time, so I'd like to just give a sense of timelines around how we're gonna be rolling information through. Let me move over to a new plan that we have just launched for this year in terms of information being fed back to uh, our farmers and, and the insights going back. So ideally, we're going to have a data insight cycle so that there's information coming out periodically throughout the year. Since we're already into 2019, the summary report and yield report that we'd like to have prior to planting, this year will come a bit later. In the future, it will be coming at the beginning of the year. We'll also be providing an economic analysis report we're currently still gathering the data and aggregating it, and we hope to have this fully done by the end of 2019, ready to really share back in 2020. Farmers will also receive a data completeness report that allows you to understand how much of your data is in, the quality of it, and the completeness, because without strong, comprehensive data, it is very hard for us to analyze and give you any results back, whether it's individualized results or broader. We do have some data completeness issues in our data set right now, and we're working actively with the field team and our farmers because we need to make sure that's complete before we can do further analysis. Towards late summer, we'll be providing a soil sample report. And as we go into winter, we'll have program updates, kind of a year-end review, and an annual data review that will come back. So we're excited to be able to launch this and ensure that you're receiving the information that you need as you go into your planting season and are making decisions. It's a quick overview of what we consider under soil health because we know that many people ask, what is soil health and what are you looking at? And really, we see healthy soil as a living ecosystem. And so it gets a, we see the holistic system and that's really where we're focused on the whole system shifting and evolving over time. There are four indicators that we measure the organic matter, our aggregate stability, available water capacity, and the soil pH and nutrients. Again, as the soil science itself evolves and our knowledge does, we are adding on other indicators, especially based on the requests that we have from our farmers to get a better understanding of what's happening in their soils. Finally, a lot of what we're doing comes back to, I think a mantra that many of you would be familiar with is, at the end of the day, agricultural productivity comes from the genetics in our plants, the environment that we're growing them in, and our management practices. We're going to be doubling down on understanding the management practices because they drive a significant part of the output, and they're also the lever that many of you can pull and are constantly pulling as you make decisions around farms. And when it comes to conservation management practices, this area is critical. So I wanna thank you all for joining and sticking through until the end. I hope that this gave you a taste of what's to come. And I encourage you to check in with us on our website. Uh, like everything else, we are updating that as well because we want it to be more user-friendly and have a lot more content that many of you are looking for. So please check us out over the next several months as we continue to evolve and update that space. 
And please do join and follow us on our various social media channels. We are on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, we have a Flickr account, YouTube, you name it, we are out there.